So cool. Um, okay. So hello, good afternoon everybody. My name is Kate Pekoski. I'm the director of the School of Art and Design here at ECU. Um, so before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping for anyone that's not familiar with our building. There is a single stall restroom if you just go out and to the right. There's also a men's room there. If you go out and up or down the ramps, straight ahead to the left, there's both men's and uh, women's restrooms as well too. Um, so first of all, I want to thank all of you for coming today and supporting the school. So I want you to know that the entire cost of your ticket, minus some taxes and fees, um, goes directly to the Friends of the School of Art and Design Recruitment, Scholarship, Endowment. That's a mouthful. <laughs> Um, so, with 40% of our art and design undergraduate students having significant financial need, which is much higher than the university average, scholarships are absolutely and truly essential to the success of our students. So thank you for coming today, um, and thank you to Scott and Mike um, for creating a great event. Mm. Um, so finally, um, a few thanks for folks that, a few thanks to folks that have made this um, event possible. So Trista Reese Porter and Sim Asher from the Greenville Museum of Art. Alex Davis in the back, who's running our wonderful AV and recording this event for us. Um, Michael Elbeck for organizing us cats and making everything happen today. I really appreciate that. Um, as well as the fabulous staff in the school and the college. Um, so let's get on to the good stuff. So it's now my honor to welcome um, and hand the stage off to artist and musician Scott Avitt and Professor Emeritus of Printmaking, Michael Elbeck. All right, so I'll get started. Just to, to make it perfectly clear, perfectly clear, I am not Scott Abbott. <laughs> just in case, just in case. So before we get started, we have a relatively brief time. So I'll try and make some of these beginning uh, comments brief. Scott has been a longtime friend of the School of Art and Design and East Carolina University. With uh, East Carolina, the larger university, at uh, one point, I'm not sure how many years ago, you were the keynote speaker at uh, one of the freshman orientations in uh, Minji's Auditorium. Yeah. And then in 2018, the Avid brothers, along with uh, Future Island and Valiant Thor, did the hurricane uh, relief? Yeah, but Hurricane Hurricane Florence relief in the School of Art, a little closer to home. Um, and again, I'm not sure exactly how many years ago we had a program making a living, making a life. How mm. you survived, not teaching, but still making your art. Uh, Scott was a contributor participant in what I feel is a wonderful printmaking exhibition from 2010. Catalog still available through mm -hmm. Matt Egan and Heather. Still. They're about to be sold One of the best right printmaking shows and catalogs you'll find. Seriously. It's very good. Very good. And graduated in 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, Scott took some print survey class, a couple of etching classes with me sort of finished up his degree in painting. I did my stuff down there. Uh, he went away, had some decisions to make after undergraduate. We'll talk about that in a minute. Well, I will, he will. And then started making linoleum prints uh, for New Year's shows, for concert tours, and started to come back annually with various members of the group. <laughs> And we had a wonderful couple of days just oh, yeah. printing linoleum blocks, and that went on for about 10 years. Then Scott totally abandoned this <laughs> by his buying own. his own press. So we have seen hiding their hair of him downstairs since. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there may be other things, but I don't remember. And and. So we'll get things started. So he's an ECU graduate. So I have questions here. Scott informed me that once he gets started, I may not be able to get another word in. So I, I may have to interrupt him. So one of the questions here that, that uh, a group of Scott together is why visual art and why study in the School of Art? Not necessarily ECU, but in general. Mm -hmm. The floor is yours. Mm. Right. Nothing to say. Nothing. Uh, <laughs> Next question. Yeah, yeah. 
And, you know, that, that um, it wasn't a clear, a clear cut decision for me ever to, to uh, uh, follow or, or go into to, uh, school for art. Um, I was only accepted to one college, that was ECU. And that was under the, the <laughs> prerequisite that I went to get a chemistry uh, uh, credit at a community college in Charlotte because I had failed science throughout high school. And ECU, with an 830 on the SAT, somehow was kind enough to say, we'll take you if you take this chemistry class. So my mom and I drove down here for the freshman orientation for the art school. And it was, um, all I can say is that I identified with it. That's, that's all I can say. All I can say was that there was a hunch that this, this is how I thought. I'm cool. <laughs> this is cool. <laughs> and I want to go after that. Where things, which is, this is not true. I wasn't cool, and this isn't the only cool thing. I mean, science is cool. You know, math is cool. But for me, this was, it, it was my way of saying, that's, that's me. This is, this is, I'm part of this. And um, so I came to the orientation and, and went, it was, it was uh, presented like, kind of like medical school. It was really serious. Like they were like, it's different in that it's really less general, like it's really focused from the get go at the time. You know, it was, it was like freshman year, you're taking art, this is what you're taking and this is where you're going. And it was, uh, it was discipline in that way that, uh, I don't know that I, I loved that, but it, all, it felt unique. It felt special and to be a part of something like that felt at least like a start for me. I didn't stay in the program, um, so I, I, I remember saying, well, I'm not. It was almost like a denial of who I am uh, because it was, it was challenging me. So after the first year in school here, I, uh, I left the art program and first <laughs> went from there to try to study zoology at the, uh, where all, my advisor was saying, this is really doesn't, you don't seem to have the makeup for, <laughs> for a zoologist or a sci any, any scientific or, or academic uh, path at that. Um, but they, you know, allowed me to make the choice. Uh, I found myself in communication uh, in broadcast, uh, radio broadcasting, uh, in performance was my focus and uh, somehow and then it, I was using art as a minor, and as I was getting through that, uh, there was a professor, Leland Wallen, who said, uh, you know, this is, your, this is your path. This is who you are. You need to stick with this. And uh, so reluctantly, uh, but with a hunch, because it was something that when I would do it, it was moving me, and I knew it was uh, something that I had some uh, ability with, um, stayed in school. And, and, and that was the first real beginning to committing myself to to being uh, an artist. But before, well before that, my dad and mom encouraged creativity in our home. Drawing, and playing guitars, and making up songs. and um, That's really the beginning of it. That's the making of it, and the models that I, I grew up with. Okay, and then when you graduated, you accepted the graduate school. Yeah, in Florida. You'd had two bands going. Well, I mean, the Abbott Brothers at that time, at that time and yeah. you had to make a decision what to do. Yep. So how did that come about, and how did you decide? Yeah. So I was really conflicted. I, I left here and opened, to, to keep my painting going, I opened a gallery, which is not exactly helpful when you want to run a studio. A studio and gallery are different things, but as far as I was concerned, they would be the same thing. I would make work. I would hold shows that had friends from here which I, I, I brought work from, from friends that we graduated with to the gallery. We had a couple big nights where we sold everything and I would work in the back. No one came to the gallery. I would go seven days and not see one customer and I'm manning this gallery. So I started teaching figurative drawing classes in the back and I would hire a model and I would, so this is what I was doing kind of in between, like trying to figure this out. All the while, my dad likes to ta take a little credit for like, oh, you know, these guys are just like helping, like really supporting them and encouraging them. But I, he clearly told me at one point, he said, you know, I think this gallery thing's a lot better option than the music, you know. <laughs> he said, I think you should put your chips in that. The music thing might or might not pan out. <laughs> so I was like, okay, yeah, you know, so I made a go at it. While I owned that, uh, that gallery slash studio, I was also in a deferral mode with uh, University of Florida, 
So I was trying to keep all my options open as, po as much as possible. And I was performing quite a bit with Seth and uh, the, the group. And um, as that sort of uh, uh, came to a head, um, I called down to try to defer for another year with Florida. The lady on the phone with the mission said, Scott, I think your decision's kind of being made here. So she said, you, we're going to be here. You, you just reapply and, and we'll, we'll talk. But I think your, your path is, is laid for you. I, at the same time, was saying if, I, if certain booked events happened, that that was the way I was going to go. But I, but I made a deal with myself when I did that, that I would always maintain a studio for visual work, no matter what. That was just a, that was kind of, you know, Jim Carrey wrote that check to himself. That was sort of my check to myself saying, I will never not create visually. That was kind of like just a deal I made with myself. So I never, I mean, in 2003, when I said no more jobs except art and music, music was the priority at the time, I, we, I moved up towards the Asheville area and my entire living room with my wife and I was uh, mirrors all over the place for different angles for me to get self-portraits and long nights of painting. And uh, so when I wasn't touring, I was still fully invested in painting. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. And then making art, I mean, we were talking one time, I said, you know, do you, people do this for fame, people do this for money. Why do you do this? Mm. Visual arts and the music. Yeah. For attention. <laughs> okay. And you've done well. <laughs> like, I mean, you drunk her out. I mean. <laughs> But I mean that fades, you know. That, that, that yeah, well, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> the more mature uh, relationship, I think, with attention would be relationship. Like you realize, like you, you, you uh, I guess, identify uh, the love and the and the good, the goodness from relationships with people, and um, it is something to talk about, and it is something to be involved with, and uh, uh, and community forms around it, one way or the other. And that really is pretty key. Uh, in, in why we do it. But yeah, since I was little, uh, you know, I wanted to be the, the center of attention uh, much more than, like now, now it comes as a distraction a lot of times for the thing, like cre being creative. It, it, self-promotion, like self-promotion and, and, and creating art can really, like, be a problem, like it can really get in the way of each other uh, for me in my life. So I try to keep that in check as far as if it's not creatively uh, interesting to me or doesn't feel like it's contributing to my creative purpose, then I say, okay, cut it clean. So, so why I do it? I, I think that I'm just programmed to do it uh, and I don't ask questions about it. And I do believe that whether I can make a living at it or not, I'll be doing it. That's that. So when you're, when you're on the road or you're at home in the studio, How do you how do you keep the creative visual activity going while you're out touring? Mm -hmm. How does that work? Well, I think in negative space, in negative, uh, let's say absence, is really is is healthy in any endeavor. So there is some uh, some healthy contemplation about about work that uh, might be happening. Um, I can use the slide now physically. Sure. Uh, this piece, we were talking about this some earlier in the classroom, this piece with the toast, the, each square is an eight by eight inch uh, square. And I have been, I've been really exploring painting with a grid on some of the large scale paintings. Even the ones that, that feel really loose, they're, they're, they tend to be gridded out in the beginning. And towards the end of the lockdown part of the pandemic, going back on the road, I was faced with that question, like how do you, you know, do you just mourn the fact that this is over and you're now in a musical form? You can't really just, I wasn't prepared to just decide that. And so what I did was I took um, squares with me. I might take three squares with me on the road. This was last year. And I, I would, uh, if I had 30 minutes, if I had an hour, I would paint in the back of the bus or a, a, a dressing room. And then I would mark the date or the place that it was painted in on the back of it. And some of them were done at the studio, but I would tend to not work on them at the studio. And, and as we were talking earlier today, the limitations drove the material. 
that limitation of going on the road. Can't use oil, can't take a massive uh, canvas, but I can take these little squares, and I am thinking in that term. So this is a way, a creative way to uh, work around those limitations, which are very limiting. Like, I, I took my boys on a trip last week to uh, Levon Helms Barn in Woodstock for a little event I was doing, and I mean, they were on a bus for 36 hours, you know, that was kind of it. And video games and movies are great, but you know, after a while it's just like, so learning how to be creative with that time and that space, because it's way less about playing music, like that's just such a little part of it, and the rest is how do you stay sane in this, in this moment where you're removed from your place. You know, as artists, we like to be like we hoard a lot of stuff, like stuff that we work on and things that are ongoing and they're moving us to the next thing. And you got to get up and leave all that. It's it's really distracting. So learning how to do that has been a dance that that's developed quite a bit. And that's that's a, a result or an example of it. Nice, nice. And I had a question about the symbiosis and creative process for visual and the music. And you had a quote in your uh, signage down in the in the museum, mm -hmm. and Josie took a picture of it and sent it to me, but I forgot to download it, so I don't know what it is. Do you remember what it is? The quote. Yeah, and it was about the connection between music and and visual arts. Mm -hmm. That you used to think of them as two separate things, but now that they're they're one. Yeah. Ah, sounds like BS to me. <laughs> you said it. Yeah, I know. Well, that's that tell you like so far where are we going anyway. Uh, no, they, they the marriage between the two. I mean, they have uh, they have, like I can see specific uh, in the layers of processes, especially recording, like building a recording and building a painting. Like I can definitely, and I think a lot of people could do this. This isn't a, a unique to me ability by any means, metaphorically or uh, uh, well, the parallel between the layers, being able to envision the layer of a sound on top of each other, and, it's, and, and in a way you can see it on the screen in a computer. It is a visual thing as well as a as a, an audible thing. But um, I definitely compare those two and see. Uh, uh, similarity, like direct similarities in them, and then I'll compare how I uh, how I may handle a bass track, and then how I may handle a first swipe of of broad or a, a monochromatic uh, underpainting as the bass track, mm -hmm. and maybe the beat is is the the grid, and then we liter literally have looped grids for music. Well, that's obvious with painting too. You grid that image in. And so I can really, those are like right in, they live with each other quite a bit. But once again, one inhabits space and one inhabits time and they're, they're, they're they mingle, but they clearly do those very different things and um, do different things in us. Is sure. one less supportive than the other at times? Supportive of each other or supportive? Yeah, of each other. I mean, does the music hurt the art, the art? In process, I don't listen to music during painting ever ever i don't i i can't some people say i just like like uh eric fischel talks he listens to music while he paints and this is not this is not something that i do i i have before when i'm printing if we're running prints it's not necessarily a decision making thing it's more of a, an adjustment print yeah there'll be some music on that the print shop feels right with music but when i'm painting and making uh, uh formal decisions or I really view painting as as a contemplative practice. There's really no space for for that that input or that that uh, mu for music. Yeah, yeah, it's really a place for quiet. So you always carry a sketchbook, or most of the time, I'm assuming. I do. Yeah. And uh, how much of a role does that play in things we're seeing in the screen? Not a lot. Not What's a lot. What's the purpose? Uh, what's the purpose in carrying one? Yeah, to write, to to write, definitely. I don't, I don't, I don't plan like the the. No, nah, I don't think anything in here. Let's see. None of these would have any. 
plan. For, now, okay, so there would be the extent of a sketchbook. That's for the, the wheel of boy where I was uh, thinking about you know, the content of that. But it's more diagram type. Okay. But there's not a lot of it. Not a lot of it. And uh, I mean, sketchbook, I'm thinking it was ideas. And then home, at one point we were talking, you had, if, oh, and I, foolish me. I forgot to mention the North Carolina Museum of Art one man show. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that minor show. <laughs> in that though, what I'm mean, thinking, you had the window frames with the jumping boy, yep. and I thought it was an interesting uh, sort of story of how that came about. I, I mean, it doesn't really have anything to do with sketchbooks, but just influences, perhaps. Yeah. Things from the homestead, if I sure. remember correctly. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, windows that I found from our original home which some of them later I found out weren't from our original home. They were just, they were just collected by my father and, and in the back of the wood shop rotting away. Um, so of course I sold them on everybody. as oh, these were out of that home. It's like, nah, these were from Stanley County, from some stranger's home. <laughs> so, but, but that's okay. Um, yeah, I like found, yeah, I like found objects and, and I like the idea of printing and use, I mean, yeah, I, I do. I, there's a there's an extent where that sort of that kind of played itself out. You know, I did it until it felt like okay. <laughs> yeah, moving on. You know. So, what kind of influences just growing up in, in in Concord have on what you do now? Yeah, parents, family. I think um, normal interactions and relationships with people obviously had. Uh, a lot to do with with uh, the directions I took with uh, from you know from young love to to parental influence and teachers and whatnot that's normal stuff I think something that was unique to our our upbringing was uh, a really big swaths of time void of of activity uh, where I know for me, I found myself alone, a lot of times outside, quiet, with, you know, you, you've kind of exhausted whatever activity you were doing, and you're sort of just piddling. Mm -hmm. And it's just you. And I have really fond memories of this, of this sort of, you know, it, a lot of it had to do with the sun and grass, and, and it sounds really Little House on the Prairie-like, but it was, it was really pretty spot on like that. I'm really grateful for that. That coupled with a dad that was, you know, we played the game like here's a shape. What do you what do you do with that? And we would draw it and then we'd go to church. I've told this story lots of times. We'd go to church and, you know, my dad would get on the envelope and draw the backs of the heads of the people that were sitting in front of us and then he'd pass it over to us. <laughs> and we'd have a big old time and then we'd draw one and then pass it over. And you you know, you get the the snicker and the like you know, somebody, like, you might say, well, it's hilarious, and Dad breaks out laughing out loud, you know. People know something's up with the Avids, you know. <laughs> Who knows what's going on with the sermon? I tried that with, I was, I was dating a, a, a girl who was Catholic, and I went to the Catholic to a mass with her. So I figured, well, this is what we do with the Methodist church. So I was like, <laughs> drawing, and I, I handed it to her, and she was giggling and kind of held back to me at the end of the mass. The priest, there, there was something going on, and I was not partaking. I, was, I guess I was told, "You don't do these things." They do, and as everybody stood, and I guess I stood with him, and he did this number to me, and just pointed at me. I was like, "Oh my God, he's calling me out for the whole <laughs> congregation." I was like, "No, nah, I don't know about this Catholic stuff." <laughs> like we're a little, we want to like ease it up a little more with the, the Methodists. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I'll tell one the Catholic stuff and then we'll get right You know all about that. We, yeah. Well, yeah, I know that, being Catholic. So we had the students in Rome, we went to the Vatican, we went to the Sistine Chapel, we were looking around and all the Bernini things and this one young lady afterwards, she said, oh, if you have a church like that, I can understand why you'd be Catholic. <laughs> it's so true, it's so true. So back to you. But they're not, but they're not into comics of, of their well, congregation. Well, if you look at some of it, maybe they are. 
I mean, that was great, though. That's great for creeps. Like a dad that's willing to do, like, you know, yeah. like kind of, it was helpful. What else did he do for you? Um, he worked really hard, really hard. He doesn't talk about it anymore, about what he did for the bulk of his life. Like, and that man, his hands were leather hard. I mean, this dude, and I would, there were things like, so I witnessed this kind of stuff. Uh, maybe I was 14, 15. Scott, get in the truck. We're going down, somebody's trying to steal the welding machine. And I'd be like, what are we going to do? I mean, I'm thinking, why don't we call the police? That's not even, come on. So-and-so, he's like, so-and-so, who works for him? My dad did work release stuff for a lot of guys, and, you know, they, they were wounded, a lot of wounded men that would work for him, and he would stick with them really well. He was critical of them, and he was hard on them, but he also was really good. And this happened on, I, I, I remember three occasions, two at his shop and one at another place. <laughs> and don't judge, folks. But he said, uh, we get in the truck, and he, like, a twenty-two pistol, and a Ziploc bag with bullets in it. <laughs> All right, son. I'm going here. If, uh, if anything happens, here's the gun. With the bullet in Ziploc <laughs> The bullets in Ziploc bags. But he's not taking it with him. Just uh, here's his 15-year-old son going with him. And we're parked, and as soon as we pull up to the shop, there's these two men. Truck backed up to his, his welders. Where they were Miller welders on, tra on trailers. And they're hooking it up. And I hear out the window, oh, Jim, Jim, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'd, I'd... And my dad just like, I mean, these two men, bigger than my dad, not even the a hesitation, just like, I saw this. And it's not that he didn't treat them like unpeople. He treated them like people, but he was, you know, he was very uh, lovingly hard on them. And they, you know, they left. And that was that. And I, don't, I would not handle that that way. You know, I'd call the police. That's just what I would do. But I saw that stuff. And uh, I have no idea if that really helps answering the question, but he... <laughs> he, he, good he story. It's a good story. It was, it was you know, probably Little House on the Prairie-like, you know? Yeah. Well, it builds character. It must, right? Yeah. yeah. But did it build his character or mine? I don't know. Maybe his character was building up. I don't well, think the, he did the flip anymore. back to the arts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, I noticed you had in the, in the catalog there wood piles, photos of wood piles. Sure. Why'd you put those in there? Well, I didn't choose those to go in there. There was a, a designer that worked with Mike Dyer. But I, what I did was send him uh, just like scrapbooks of images that I, yeah. So I took it and sent it in. So there was a whole co like collage or list of images that um, I ran like. Rapid fire was like, oh, this is one. Yeah, yeah. So as I would as I would go through my my activities at home, um, the point in this in this book is in this catalog is to um, to show kind of what was what's happened visually at, at the property and from 2020 to now, really early 2020 till now. So um, he really. Uh, curated the book. Uh, but for uh, stacking wood, it's like a, you probably do some wood stacking, don't you? Some, some. It's, uh, it's something that I'll like, I'll stack and then, nah, bring it back down, restack. You know, it's gotta be, it's gotta be right. right. I really love it. Uh, so I think, I think ultimately it, it's in, it should be in there because it's, it's just yet another medium. I think okay. that's the point. And making paintings, I'm sure they all don't come out exactly like you'd like. Uh, not what are some failures, but when they don't go right, what, what do you learn? What does it teach you? Mm. And do you have an example? You have I'm one. sure you didn't put anything that didn't work right in Yeah, the, in I can maybe pick one that didn't work, is, that has uh, some strong weaknesses. <laughs> <laughs> Show funny. us a poor painting. Some strong, <laughs> some strong weaknesses. <laughs> um, or how? Well, maybe that's not a good question. How do you? How do you sense? How do you tell when maybe it's just not going like you'd hoped? Yeah, I think I think they go in waves. So I think they get into a zone that they're finished, and then they sort of, if you keep going, they go out of that zone. 
And then you can make the choice to keep going until they're in that zone again. I'd say both of these paintings were in many, many, uh, have ha had many phases to them. And I think the lesser known mystic one on the bottom right, I, I do think that one's successful, but the one on the top left, um, I'm not so sure about it. I don't really know. I, I had to stop bothering with trying to know on it. It's two paintings actually that are attached, two panels. Um, but I was trying to do a lot with it. Yeah. And I, and I spent a lot of time with it and it, it challenged me um, some of the some of the images and some of the re the sources that I was painting from were, were difficult. So. so is it something you can pinpoint or is it just kind of a feeling? Oh, uh, I can pinpoint. Uh, yeah, I can say like the, the preacher's hand, uh, the, the source that I was working from was really awkward and grainy and weird. And so it was hard to read the form. Yeah. And I, wa I wasn't concerned with it being perfect by any means, but uh, it, looked, it looked awkward the way it was, it was landing. Uh, so once I got it to something that sort of looked Sort of kind of Sort of looked like it could be on the boy's head. I was like, okay, that's good. <laughs> We're done. And then the melding of the notebook paper coming into it, uh, that was something that constantly changed. Um, I love the painting. It doesn't have to be a masterpiece. I love the painting. I feel very warm to the painting. But yeah, that, that, and then drawing a shadow, wondering if those shadows of the boy and the dog, the boy and the, the man with the dog, yeah. um, that was something that I thought would go a different way. Um, and I don't know if it reads as it does, and like I know how I look at it, but I wonder if, if you even see that as a shadow at first. You know, I don't know. I don't know either. Well, if it's another question that you have a painting, you have something in mind, and somebody comes up and looks at it and tells you the story that makes perfect sense has nothing at all to do with what you were thinking of. Totally. Is that a bothersome thing? Is that no. an interesting thing? Yeah, I, it's not a bother. I, I think that whatever you or anybody else says it's about is is good with me. It's fine. I mean, and like, barring they come up and say this means, you know, <laughs> this, the message here is for me to go, you know, do something yeah. terrible. Uh, <laughs> depending on what your definition of terrible is. I don't know how to ask. Um, I'm thinking something, there are things like that may happen because you put everything into it. So they have something they can get out because obviously they're looking at something that's important, important to you anyway? Yeah, I think this is a good example of what I just pulled up. Uh, let me see if I can explain it, if this answers it. The portrait of my grandfather, William, at the bottom, yeah. yellow and red, I was wanting to test an approach, and I needed what I would say is just a, a quick image. So I, and, and in my mind I was saying, I just an, an arbitrary in, image is all I need. I don't need this to be fundamentally or, or formally like the, 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 the composition doesn't need to blow me away. I just need to put paint to canvas in this process. So I picked a, a picture of my grandfather that I've seen since I was a little kid. It's been on a bookshelf. And to me, it was like, this is just a, an everyday image that I see all the time. But if I hear people talking about, oh, I love family paintings, and I love heritage paintings, and that's what I've heard someone say to me about these paintings. And I'm like, I guess they are that. To me, they were a practice, yeah. and, and a relatively arbitrary one. I love them, and I love those people, but it really wasn't the point at all. <laughs> but that's, that's okay, like, why did I, I mean, you know, it, it, if it does that, then it's, it's more real than whatever I'm saying right now, anyway. You know what I'm saying is probably nonsense. I just know that I was painting the thing, and it was, it was what I was doing, and I was good. done. So people see that they like that. Your influences. I know Caravaggio. Oh yeah, for yeah, sure. a long time. For a long time. Uh, who else? Who else do you look at regularly? And and like I don't know, mentors. Yeah, my path was when it was painting. It was uh, the first paintings that sitting in this room looking at art history and I didn't realize Alice Neal was one of them but she, Alice Neal, Wayne Tebow and uh, uh, Degas. The three different time, like different things, all three different things but they moved me a lot and they, they, they roll, they echo in my visual uh, computing and then as I He'll turn the pages. Corbet was another painter that, when I would read about his championing the 
like the, the, the Salon des Refuse, where he was setting up in the parking lot against the Salon, like that whole thing really stirred me up and I loved it. The Caravaggio, as far as the chiaroscuro lighting and what I wanted to do with form, and uh, I really wanted at the time when I was doing the portraits like motherhood and fatherhood, I was thinking about, can you get chiaroscuro lighting with a bright background working? Can I chiaroscuro light someone, then put them on a, a Wayne Tebow background, and does it does it make sense? And and uh, I think Wayne Tebow did some of that too. Um, uh, Malcolm Morley has been a massive influence since I discovered his work in 2018, and I discovered his work through Eric Fischel, who was a big influence uh, when I met I read his book and then met him. Uh, Sally Mann as a photographer and as as her sort of commitment to place. And understanding that, in hindsight, has been uh, an influence and inspiration. Uh, in real time, this happens in music too with people that I know. I'll tend to listen to a lot of work from people that I know that I'm friends with, and it means even more. Uh, you know, you, Leland, uh, Scott Eagle, Michael Vores was really big for me. Like uh, James McElhaney was really a big influence. These are professors that were here, seeing that firsthand, and then and then in hindsight understanding what the the work is that's really been put in. I said Diane Banks was a was and it made a great impression on me as a friend and when I was just lost. You know, I didn't even know this was what I was going to do. And I still remember what she was uh, saying to me. So, um, yeah, among many, I, I'm I'm definitely Andy Warhol is a massive uh, uh, influence. Fine, you're right. I mean, Andy Warhol could draw. I mean, and he can print like a screen print. Yeah. The silk screens are are key. Basquiat on the, in that in that regard, uh, and I know now uh, Rauschenberg is really big for me too because I like. In fact, going back to that, uh, yeah, yeah, the bottom yeah. right is yeah. uh, thinking a lot about Rauschenberg and looking at a lot of Rauschenberg. It's, it's how large are those? I was going to ask. Uh, you that one is. Make something up. I can't remember. <laughs> the the mystic Two one is three. it's down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the top one is yay tall. Okay. And from like me to you, and then the lesser known mystic is is what six feet tall, maybe. Okay. Something like that. Six seven feet tall. So have you found any any limitations in the visual arts? Things that you'd like to do that you just haven't been able to figure out. Yeah. Or lithography. Well, lithography, yeah. Well, you're going to come back and take that's, I'm going to take that course here. <laughs> I'm also going to try for the basketball team. <laughs> <laughs> I've been playing basketball, and I'm really inconsistent, but, I mean. Okay. I, uh, I missed something there. How many? <laughs> right How right many classes my, do you I'll have to take? I'm blaming on my hearing. How many classes do you have to take? to be on a team, you know, <laughs> to be on a sports team. You're asking the wrong okay. person. I'm not even sure what a basketball is. <laughs> <laughs> so is there a particular, maybe one in here, maybe not, maybe one in the show that sort of reflects you as a person? Like totally? Completely. Completely. <laughs> um, 80%. There's a Caravaggio uh, uh, oh, yeah, driven. Yeah. And that one's difficult to photograph. It pops a little more than that, but definitely a chiaroscura effect from the, the flame. Um, or painting you wouldn't want to have go away. You yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep. Yeah, there's like. The one of, of Sarah in the bikini at the at the museum. Is that the one in the room, the smaller room on the yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. That one's a, a series that I did two of the kids. I haven't done the third one yet. I decided, yeah, I said, I don't think I need to sell I don't want to sell this. Um, I think it has mostly to do with the transitional moment of, of when it was painting and my, my attachment to it. Uh, yeah, you know, they're all doing that, and they're all me. Like a lot of the, the portraits, like they're of my kids, but I feel like they're self-portraits in so many ways. I really do. Um, yeah, 
You know, the creek was was a really uh, it was an epiphany uh, moment in in commitment and discipline towards kind of all in and a very limiting sort of commitment, like we were talking about, just a lot of time in something. I actually drew it as a pencil drawing first and was not going I was going to be pencil on canvas. That was my plan. So I drew it really detailed. Uh, in fact, there's this process. So at the top oh, up there. left, yeah. So I really drew it a lot and it, it didn't, it just, it just was a cop out. Uh, I felt, I felt like I was avoiding the color thing. But I'd say so that one. So you painted one, right over the graphite? Yep. Is that Why bad? Why don't you stretch into a canvas and have both? <laughs> yeah, I need to draw it again, I guess. Scrapes the paint off. Scrape the paint off. <laughs> Seth owns that painting, so he Do might not like that. Yeah, maybe not, maybe not. What else did I have here? There's a question on uh, COVID, COVID, how did it impact studio? Yeah, I mean, Working. obviously it opened up time. Uh, and, and maybe not more like thinking opened up time, but it, it, it made me feel like there was endless time to be there. And I didn't know, you know, it kind of felt like it was forever. Knowing it wouldn't be forever, but it, was, it felt like it. So it, it, that is an example, the creek is an example of that. Uh, ability to say, well, I'm here, I'm here, so yeah. I have, I, I likely have the time. That was, uh, that wasn't hurting the creating, or the creative process. It helped it. So you have connections with galleries, what, you're in Aspen, Chicago? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have been in New York yet? Uh, At least at one No, something. not really, not, not formal, not formal. And then exhibitions and sales. Uh, oh, yeah. How did all that come about? I mean, I'm sure people are interested in getting out of school, yeah. trying to get into a gallery. How did that happen for you? Yeah. So when I came out of school, the first thing I did in Charlotte was get involved in that community and was painting in Charlotte and getting to know people. There was one point where I went to Asheville as well and literally carried around. A pamphlet that I had made with my images from school and I went to galleries and said hey my name's Scott Avid I wanted I just want to know that you know I'm here so I did that in Asheville and Charlotte um, as that sort of calmed down and then as music settled in I, I I recognize okay I'm not you can show some things things will sell for good or bad prices but you're not going to really be able to make a body of work to be shown like this uh, if you keep letting them go. If, uh, and I, I didn't have the time and space to do it in a short amount of time. So I didn't show really a lot from 2004-ish or, yeah, four until 2012. I rented out an a abandoned apartment in Charlotte and put on a show there with a, a friend, Tom Schultz, who was, he acted as the curator and sold a ton of work out of it. It felt really, uh, I went and bought a truck with the money I, I made from it. I bought a 68 Ford uh, F100 Ranger. It was uh, black. It was so awesome. And it was $6,500, you know, not a bad buy. And, but I remember thinking, well, that's it. You know, it's all gone. And I really don't have a shit. Like, that's it. All that work's gone. <laughs> I probably made, you know, I probably, well, yeah, I probably made $15,000 at the end of the day. And half of that's gone now. <laughs> and I got to pay for the lease and I got to pay the people out. You know, once it's all done, you're like, well, that really, that was like eight years of work. <laughs> that, that's, that's gone now. <laughs> so it's like, this, this doesn't really add up. <laughs> so then I made another deal with myself at that point and said, unless the venue is perfect, I'm not showing. Until, and, and, and I'm not showing also until I'm out of my ears with artwork. So that's when I sort of, uh, around that time, let's see, those were made. That was around the time that I uh, moved into my current studio and uh, the next show that I did was North Carolina Museum of Art. And I was gonna ask you, how did that come about? Uh, through SoCo in Charlotte and, uh, well, Marjorie, Marjorie. Uh, what's Marjorie's last name? Hodges. She just, she, she was at the museum 
she just championed my work so much and she would visit and say, oh, let's do it at this museum. And she's like, it's going to happen. And then she would move to another place. She's like, okay. But this lady, it was so good to me and so generous. And she's the one that really, that really got me there. But it was just about believing in the work. I'll say this, like our relationship with Rick Rubin in the music world, his, this would have happened around 2007 or eight. Some things that we would talk about, he said, you make the work, you put everything in it, every bit of the rest will follow. Let's don't, we're not making this to be a hit. We're not making it to get wealthy. Just put everything we've got in it. All that stuff, if it's to be, will be. And that's fine. And just settle that in your heart. So I, I just said, I took that seriously and said, well, I'll make this work. And, and when it's time to show it to somebody, I will, and it'll present itself. I'm in enough of a, of a, a communal setting. Like, I speak to enough people, I can let them know, hey, you might want to come over and see some, I've got some stuff, and yeah, I'm willing to bring you over. So that's how that, that came about. Um, and that show led to what is, like, that was 2019 and 2020. 20, 2019 and 2020, so... Uh, this is sort of the next installment of that. But, but 2015, when I met Eric Fischel, that was a, a he kind of was like, y yeah, you need to, you need, like, he was the last. I'd been pushed and cared for for, for so long from so many people, but it still had, there was still a little bit of a hesitation and some commitment that, yeah. like I, I would say things like, maybe I just need to quit this. Like I would say, I'm closing the studio down. I'm not, what am I doing? Because I would be making so many more songs. And then I would say, you know, Seth and Bob, and they can do something else. Like, I don't have to be in this. Maybe I need to devote myself to this. And I would always go this either or thing. Like, how, how is my exit? What's my exit? <laughs> and then, uh, you know, it's like, you, why, what are you doing? You don't need to do this. Like, I think you can do them both. And so. <laughs> so you decide at some point you're not going to show in galleries unless they're perfect. Yeah. You're not going to get a job. <laughs> Other than, well, I mean, he's talking downstairs. Yeah, that, yeah. You know, you, you have to do music, you, you make the fine art, you have a job doing something that eats away the time, so he decides he's not going to have a job. Yeah, that's right. Where's the discipline come from for that? I mean, I'm thinking most of us aren't going to make that decision. It's like, well, I have to have a job. Does yeah. it come from your family? So, you know, we were gifted, and not everybody, like I, I have loved ones in, in my family that don't experience this. I know this is, this is quite a privilege. But we were raised with people telling us, regardless of what happens, it's going to be okay. Period. And that wasn't, that didn't mean it's going to be a pe it's going to be comfy. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't mean everything you're going to be rich. It didn't mean any of that. It meant it's going to be all right. And and you can there's a lot of ways that we all translate that and and explain that. And we and some people get quite argumentative about their way of explaining it. <laughs> but the fact was was that there's a settling in that that allowed a confidence where I was uh, you know it's almost like an ignorance like a naivete naiv naive, naive, how do you say it naivete Naivete. Naivete. I guess maybe that's wrong. Sounded good to right, me. Right? Um, that we carry. So we, I know for me, I would in my mind, I do this still to this day, I would craft my own success story. Like whatever I'm doing. It's going to lead to a good make, it's go, it, Yeah, it either, it, it is a success. Like how is it a success? You know, really, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not goofing off here, like seriously. Yeah. And I don't know that that must be a gift from some. That must be paid forward or gener generosity. And, and I believe that through life, there's always another challenge uh, before before me. I think about that a lot. But um, so in the art, like doing that and being able to let go of that and say, "Well, we're going for this." It didn't feel like such a high stakes thing. Which I think is key in all this stuff, like the high stakes thing, like, oh my God, if I don't make something great, or if I'm not great, uh, whatever, whatever. Like, it's like, it's okay, it's okay, like. <laughs> just do it. Just do it. Do it and something will happen. Yeah. yeah. I mean, seriously, that's really all that needs to be said. Because uh, it really is fun doing things. <laughs> it's, fun. it's fun making things, Michael. Like, I know. 
Like it's a lot of fun. And there's no there's no end to the mediums that you can like you can stack some wood. That's just pretty fun. <laughs> pretty good. All right, we're gonna we're gonna get to some question and answers. So so one more. What advice do you have for for students or somebody who's beyond being a student and is thinking about music or whatever? What do you say mm -hmm. to them? They come up to you and say, "Man, geez, you know." Just mm. getting out of school, I'm a student. What, what's your advice? Mm. I think we just said it. Um, uh, I mean, to simplify that, I'd be like, well, relax. <laughs> well, I mean, as I said, not just relax, <laughs> really just try everything, take advantage um, of everything you have here. Yeah, yeah. I probably already said it uh, today, Michael. And what did I say on the phone when you and I were just sort of talking a little bit about this stuff. Do you remember? I was probably like, I was probably on a caffeine high at the time, so I was really like, I forgot. Oh my God, God, it's advice. like this, it's like this. Uh, I don't know, I don't know. Um, what do you tell your children? Yeah, it, mm. I mean, you got to trust yourself. That's that's key, but that doesn't do it. That's not enough. What I'm saying it needs to be. It wants to be something even simpler. I mean, I can't I can't force that answer. I don't know it yet. Okay. Okay. So and, and if question. someone asked me specifically, "Hey, this is what's happening. What yeah. do you think?" I'd be more than happy to talk about it. But I, man, in general, no. In general, just work hard. How, who would I be to to know? Yeah, to know what to say. I Where's know. Hannah? Where is Hannah? Get to work. <laughs> I mean, but see, Hannah told me that. Yeah. <laughs> Hannah tells everybody that. And I watched him tell some people that weren't getting to work, and it wasn't, you know. And he told it to him nicely, like the first three times. <laughs> but the fourth, fifth time, he's like, oh. That's All right, and I'm going to do a question, but, but you've told me this story, and, and I think you need to tell them. You and Seth. And the pillows. <laughs> yeah. That I used to stuff his shirt with a yeah, pillow yeah. so I could beat him up? Y'all yeah. <laughs> have heard that story, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, I encourage my boys to do the same. I'm like, uh, I mean, let's see. There might be even a, a parallel. Uh, Seth, once again, Seth is so sweet. And he's so, so kind-hearted. Now, He's also really sharp tongue and, and, and can say things that are like not cool. And he's been like that since he was little and he knew how to speak to like, he always had such a good, uh, a good hold on the English language. Like he could say adult things to people. It's like, you know, he's like, that's, it was tough. Um, and I would be kind of like the older brother, like I'm just gonna clobber you then or whatever. But then that was, he didn't like that either. But. Uh, <laughs> But he was so sweet, and if I could say, listen, man, I want to, he's talking about a story where I said, I'm going to teach you how to handle yourself if a bully ever attacks you. And so my whole goal was just so I could have something to punch on. And so I got him to put pillows in his, in his shirt on the front and the back and just wailed on him. Uh, <laughs> and so y'all, you don't know Seth personally, but uh, he really doesn't like to pick like that. Like I grew up, all the friends that I had, we would, you know, you wrestle until there was a torn ligament or something. Like, that's what you did. <laughs> Seth didn't grow. He was like, yeah, just, just <laughs> take it easy, all right? He said, growing up with an older brother, it was kind of like, I get it. He probably was like, no. Ah, uh, that's good. Well, we thank you for that. So we'll have questions and answers. I'm not going to pick anybody because if I don't pick you, you'll be angry with me. You're going to do that because if he doesn't pick you, you'll just be disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't pick up. So well said. Well, there might not be questions. Any questions. Somebody. Ah, there you go. Oh, Jesus. So no, you got it. Cut my hand off. Um, do you ever feel stuck creatively? And if you do, do you have any like standby strategies that you employ to seek out inspiration? Um, sure. I mean, there are days where I'll go in and be like, "This didn't happen." Like, like you know, I'm just making a. For whatever, uh, there might be something going on at home that needs my attention, or, or weather may not allow. Whatever, um, 
or if I'm just making a mess in the studio where it's like this is not uh, these days I just I just leave I'll just leave and if it's uh, if I have time I'll take a walk or I'll try not to do you know something like get on my phone or something I'll try to to just not not bother with it maybe there's something that I uh, coffee with my dad or something that I haven't done in like months but uh yeah but I, I, I don't that sounds really scary like writer's block thing sounds really scary to people but I just try to make keep that that that's little I'm not once again what if I never made anything ever again yeah, it's, I mean business. what tragedy is that like it might be kind of nice <laughs> So, yeah, so I just try not to make a big deal about it. Don't we all do that thing where we're like, oh my gosh, I, I did this, so this is me now. And it's like, nah, it's, it's not. Yeah. How does that translate that when you're doing a show? So obviously in your studio, you can walk out, but if we're standing there and we're excited to come out. Uh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just get quieter and less, less movement. Sometimes the shows like will be like, uh, and nobody understands what I said this the other day and, I, and like an encouraging thing I might say alright guys we're playing it straight tonight and they're like we can tell from an audience I mean there's obviously there is a tone to a show we sure that from audience so wouldn't that be weird like, if there wasn't assume that. wouldn't it be strange if it was the same thing like to me yeah. Yeah. that's I mean that and there's nothing wrong with it I guess strange I guess strange to me but uh, I like going to see shows that I can depend on that, that are performances um we blur those lines so much that uh, I just trust that people are there and they're okay to see. Like I don't have to, you know. I, I just trust that. I mean, because you're there to, to see the experience. Uh, Rick used the example of um, Radiohead one time. He was like, uh, he said there was a two-night stay, and he saw him in Tom York one night. He said he was bouncing off the walls. He said the next night he didn't move from one place, and he's like, loved every minute of it. Both of them. They were both great. I don't know. I know, but it definitely does translate. Yeah. There are definitely days where it's like it's feeling spot on, like otherworldly, and then other days it's. But the difference now is that that just because that's my perspective doesn't mean it's someone else's. And what's my job to do, really, really? And the job is is to deliver, you know, the the song. Do you feel resentful when you have to come out and do it and you're not wanting to? Do you feel does it does it feel frustrating? Because uh, you can walk out of your studio. Mm. You wish you would just leave this No. No, I don't want you to leave. We love performing. We love performing. <laughs> no, I'll leave. No. Um, Who do you think you are, Van Morrison? <laughs> no, I heard, yeah, uh, Jamie Johnson, I heard, walked out on one recently where he, he just said. Well, I kind of, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure it's great for the fans, but I do appreciate the sincerity where he, I think there were people just talking and he was just like, oh, you're really not here yes. to hear yes. me. And I think I'm going to go now. How much does that impact you guys on stage? Because I know it's fans, but people felt sorry. It's okay. It. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, it's just, it's harder work. It's harder work, but it's okay. I mean. But you, you understand where you play, like you play in certain places. Sometimes it's like, sometimes we're told this, the 75% of this crowd are season pass holders, the ticket holders. They, they're they here because they're here for every concert. And we're like, that's fine. They're, we're just here to be us and, and carry on. It's not always easy, but, but it's not the end of the world ever. I want to switch back to your, your artwork yeah. a little bit. Um, you were talking about when you did the stream and um, the um, painting of the uh, priest with the kids and stuff. Mm -hmm. And you said it was a combination of two paintings together and the stream was originally a pencil and then you painted it. How did you know that you weren't done? I mean, was it just a feeling that you had that you knew you had to add more and you had to put the two paintings together? Because I think that's kind of amazing because you think you did a whole painting and you had to do something else to it. How does that Yeah, yeah. Well, that, it's not just a feeling. Uh, Formally, there are a lot of things firing during that. So you're looking and you're taking out and you're, you're, you're being with. And that is where, where I, can, I can like talk in terms of feel and, and, and notion and instinct all I want. But when we get down to like nuts and bolts, there are really things that there's, a, uh, there's activating uh, 
shapes and forces happening visually for all of us. And you don't have to be a, a scholar to know it. People, I think people notice that stuff. And uh, for the artist, mimicking nature in their own world, like, you know, like the lesser known mystics painting, um, or, or some of those are a good example too. Like in designing those, there's a lot of shifting going on for me when I'm designing these paintings, a lot, because they're pretty, that once they happen, once they settle, they're static uh, in, in their uh, content or in their forms. But like the lesser known mystic, something like that, that's kind of a flat plane painting is, is only operating on sort of what happens here and what, what happens there. Uh, there was a lot of adjusting there for me to be okay, to feel like everything's happening like it should. Uh, once again, the one with the, the preacher, I just don't know if it ever really, uh, if it ever found its spot. In the recording, we do this in the studio. It, this is not, not in the, figuring out what the finished product is, but, is, but this is takes. It's like if you're going to do a take, we'll do a song, and then we'll do it again, and then we'll do it again, and then we'll do it again, and now you start feeling it's like, you start going, oh, we're, we're hitting on all, it's in the pocket. They always say pocket. It's in, it's, it's really, really settled in. And it'll do that. And then we'll do it. So we know that we all feel that at least Seth and Bob and I will be feeling it. And then we'll make the call when it's like, okay, we're, we're going down now and we can feel it. And you're just, and then you step back and it's like, take it again. And we'll just ride the wave again. So <clears throat> you always hear these stories of, oh, I was lightning a bottle. So-and-so recorded this in one take, da, 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 da. It's fine. But that one take might, for us might be one of 25 takes. Yeah. And that was the dividing line for us growing into a professional just find work ethic. Just interesting because of the screen, the pencil drawing, it's almost like the negativity in that, I feel like when I look at it, my mind actually fills in the negativity of where it's missing. And then when you see it where it's painted, it's like, yeah, that's it. That's mm -hmm. exactly what I was seeing mm -hmm. that it was not there. So yeah. And that also says a lot about me and my, uh, the way I identify uh, with practice. And when I like, Elbex asked me if I have a sketchbook, but then I'm doing a pencil drawing on a, I say no, I didn't plan, I don't plan a lot on there, but then I plan something to the T on a canvas. So it's really, it's just a matter of, of how I'm, I'm doing it. So ultimately I can talk about how that was, like it was gonna be a pencil drawing. It was always gonna be a painting. I think I was just working myself into it, like slowly, you know what I mean? And it's a great photo, I like the photograph. This is a screen print of it right there. So that's a four, a four color screen of it uh, from the photograph that I worked from. And that's, that prints really uh, nicely. And uh, I've done it on a couple of occasions. There's, there's one of those in, in Charlotte right now. <laughs> oh yeah, it makes sense. Um, maybe you could go back and, and talk a little bit about, about scale, because you mentioned forcing yourself into the small paintings, just for portability and to be able to create. Yep. Yep. Uh, do you are you thinking about uh, you know, referencing your influences in terms of scale and in terms of just liking that size? Right. I, or do you find yourself wanting to replicate the human figure at scale yeah. and how do you deal with intimacy and you know on, on, as you do you want to make those decisions yeah so we were talking about this some today with the painting and printmaking classes uh i had always kind of approached the figure naturally i, I sort of uh, uh i started doing it when i was in school painting in life size so even if the canvas was eight by ten the, the head was going to kind of take up the whole thing uh I also try over time recognizing sort of this stroke that I had that I would would gravitate towards versus a small and and also kind of what brushes felt like really practical things like that led me to to identifying what how I want to work then to I guess a conceptual thing was to glorify subject which I loved the way Courbet or or uh, you know Carbaggio would bring the people from the streets in as, as divine characters like that that resonates with me so I like the idea of scale speaking to to the viewer with ordinary people your family members or people that you know well that aren't 
looked at as you know big, but now they're big, and and here it is. Uh, also, in the space that I may be in, I'll tend to work the the I'll tend to push the boundaries of the space no matter what. So like for the the wheel of boy, we had to take the door, we had to cut into the frame of the studio because. <laughs> Because we assembled it in there and then it couldn't come out. <laughs> so, <laughs> we had a guy in Illinois that built a boat in a wood shop and then discovered he couldn't get it out. Yeah, ah. yeah. So that's happened on occasion. But I, but that that I tend to want to, and I think I, that's probably something I do in in different aspects of life. Hannah. Uh, my question. Do you sing when you are painting first to yourself? And if you want to reflect that, do you see the same harmony in your musical color? Because I see a lot of harmony and music in your painting at the Human Museum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what do you want your audience to gain from your painting as much as you see? Yeah, yeah. Um. So I, a lot of times when I start singing in, in, the, in, the, in the painting process, I'll find myself taking a break with a notebook. I do believe you're, you're on to something that my interest in color and use of uh, 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 slight variations as well as complementaries and then, and then going more complex, hopefully, I think they really do mimic the harmony among vo voices as well as the harmony among characters within a group like a band or an organization that work together and all the, the parts of the fire in that a painting or a sculpture they all they have all those elements and that that's working together so I, I can see that parallel uh, I can imagine that uh, yeah easily and I think that um, my hope would be that I can open up and be the open book that I, I hope to be and that what I'm doing is just just expressing who I am to people as many people as I can to see what that that uh, to, to see what that does to to either strike up conversation or maybe push myself into something um, and I hope I don't miss opportunities to be as revealing as I can be in that do I sing for myself? Yeah, singing your painting. <laughs> or you quiet? Now I do. <laughs> I mean, how am I not going to now? I mean, if you guys don't know, if Hannah tells me, if he asks me, do you say, I say yes, I do. <laughs> I think it's kind of connected to what you were saying, but I was wondering how much leads, like, do you ever write lyrics and when you have a song that influences? Something you might want to paint, um, like one of the pretty girls or something, mm. or vice versa. Is there painting and you're painting it and you're seeing lyrics are going or coming out? I mean, I don't. There's like I hear about these sort of seeing things that happen. the the best The best link I could make. I'll just like to really be clear about what I do to be just as uh, uh, descriptive as as possible. I listen usually to audiobooks. It's usually a Thomas Merton conference from his his stories to the novices in the '60s. Or his 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 teachings. Uh, I'll occasionally listen to Rumi. I'll listen to uh, uh, there's a podcast called Turning to the Mystics by James Finley. Um, I'll listen to sometimes by uh, autobiographies. Uh, sometimes they'll like you know Val Kilmer's book or uh, Mark Lanigan's book was really great narrated by him. So I'll I'll listen to to speaking. It's very much like church and prayer to me. It really is that. And so those, so that's why I'll tend to lean towards something that is is poetic or metaphoric uh, in nature and, and somewhat sim symbolic in its truth. Uh, and I live in that, and I really I, that really it's fulfilling to me, and it's like prayer time and like med meditation. And each moment with each square is is that. So that link is happening constantly, constantly. And so then I start to really not, once it's decided what I'm painting, it really becomes pretty secondary because I'm just longing to be in that space. 
And then sometimes in that space, I think good paintings happen. And sometimes, yeah, maybe, you know, I'd say this, a lot of times when that's happening, good paintings happen. When they, when I'm overthinking it, they, they kind of tend to not, they get kind of, and that, I would say the one with the preacher is one where I was probably overthinking and, and falling out of it. Um, musically though, what happens during that stuff like that, if you're listening to Hafiz or Rumi, there is so much metaphoric, like beautiful thought and you're getting moved by it. So lyrics, I mean, all the time they're coming. And so you just have to obey that and go and write it down. Mm -hmm. My daughter's an art major, and she'll say to me, Mom, I'm okay, but you should see my classmate stuff. Like, there's this phenomenal mm -hmm. mm -hmm. place for, like, not comparing yourself to the point that you're like, I'm going to let them do this. And yep. Up. Yeah. That's a hard one. It's really hard. It's really painful to compare yourself to, uh, to other people. And... Uh, <laughs> It's toxic as all get out when it comes to being who you are. There's no, um, I don't know if there's any use for it. I hear like people talk about how competition was good for their art creating and uh, it's never been really good for mine. Deadlines can be okay once something's sort of sussed out creatively. I mean, some, we just gotta have them sometimes. They're, they're definitely helpful and budgets can be okay because there's just so, so much money to do what you wanna do. But I just like setting setting goals like that. I mean, I would just tell every artist that, and this is what our our folks were telling us, and they were told the same. I'm sure is that nobody can be, and it sounds so silly. So we got to find new ways to say it that people will buy it because it's true. That you just can't. Nobody can be who you are. Like you are the best at that. Like you are like you dominate with that. I mean, it's it's big time. And then when you really believe that. Then you go, oh, okay, all right, you know. And also, you don't have to be the best at everything. Uh, then you, you know, forget. But that's it's really hard. But it's totally doable. You really, I Elbeck, let, when you were young, did you use competitive opportunities as a as a driver, or did you kind of as you were growing as a Elbeck's work is is incredible. Did you kind of say, hey, you know what, this is a non-issue. I'm doing I'm doing what I'm doing and. I, no, you didn't look. I had friends, our even and, and teachers I had that I thought were just wonderful, but it was stuff that I couldn't do. That's so yeah, that's like, key. Oh, why would I? And was, I was a painting major. I went to a Francis Bacon retrospective in Chicago, and saw a real painting, and I thought, get out. Yeah. <laughs> you need to find a better profession because you're never going to match what I saw. I was like, no way. And then we saw Lucian Freud. Yeah. Last come year. On. Come on. Oh, man. Yeah. You know. You know. I look at my painting and I'm thinking, Jesus, it's kind of a bad joke. <laughs> 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 at the time, I thought it was wonderful. I couldn't understand why the teachers didn't like it. Yeah. And that's, I'll admire on one. I had a guy all through undergraduate and competitive. This guy was like comparing all the time. And I didn't like him, he didn't like me. The end of semester, I went into my studio. There was my stool and paper towel. It says your your painting is terrible. Your tenacity is commendable. That was it. That was a senior final credit. I sort of confirmed what maybe I thought when I saw the Francis Bacon show. It's like he could have been right, even though I didn't like him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a tricky one. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> no hard feelings. And also, how did you come up with the rooster holding the chicken? Well, it just, I didn't even have to come up with that. There's a cartoon. No, I saw, I saw it on Looney Tunes, and I was like, that is ridiculous looking. It's so awesome. I mean, it's just ridiculous. This is a chicken ho or a rooster holding a chicken hawk <laughs> with a bonnet on. I was like... So of course I got on the phone with Bob and said, "Hey, is is it okay? Can you just paint for?" It? He's like, "As long as you don't print it, you can paint all you want, all the Looney Tunes you want." I said, "Oh, it's all." <laughs> and you don't have the one in the show that you sent me the slide. I can't remember which one it was. I had two parts. Talk about turning one upside down halfway through. I'm trying to think when you're walking over. 
It wasn't the fishing lure, it was before that. Mm. And I can't, and the fishing lure is not here, is it? Yeah, it's not here. Okay. It's not here. Are you talking about the other one that's with it on this one? No? No, that's a fishing lure. It was one just before yeah, that. And it was going to be in showing Charlotte. And you could oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. It was that this, this one that. right there. The one on the right? No, you passed that with a swimming pool on the left. No. Swimming pool. Is it the swimming pool? Yeah. No. Not that one? No. I have, to, I have to go back and look at something. Okay. I'm sorry, you guys are asking questions. I'm yeah, sorry. next. <laughs> Okay, all right, all right. So I'm familiar with your lyrics and your art, and in both there's a lot of intimacy, right? And in the art world, and especially in grad school, we're always asked these two questions. Who is your audience and what does it mean? Mm -hmm. Does that affect you now that you're outside of that environment? Do you just make to make? Do you actually think about this? Are you, you know, there's artists that are activists, and so their art is intentionally to inform and talk about, but there's so much intimacy that I see from your work, and I'm curious, does that question haunt you now that you've been out of here? Because there's a lot of us in this room that I'm sure can agree we are so tired of hearing that. Uh, so tired of all here, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think I was tired of hearing it too. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I, um, yeah, where I'm at right now is I avoid that, that question quite a bit and, and, and replace it with just, once again, a trust that all of my advocacy, uh, I, well, I trust that there's an audience. But I did that probably before I was in school. I, I believed. I was sort of fostered into believing that everybody cares about what you have to say or what you what you do, and that's that. You know, that's a double-edged sword. It can be, you know, you get a little. There's some egoic pro, like some ego problems with that. Um, so you got to get that in check. But there's nothing wrong with believing that the world cares what you have to say. And if you do, regardless if they actually hear it or not. Uh, so that was sort of settled for me early without me messing with it. But now I really trust, uh, I mean, I really, I put all my chips in it, that my politics and my advocacy and my spirituality and, and the, the, whatever I am trying to convey as a message will, I can't, I can't avoid it. You know, if it's a, a screen print on a piece of paper with yellow legal pad, it's in there, it's in there. And that there's an audience for it somewhere, and end end of story. Uh, you advocate you you're allowed to do that. You know what I mean? Everybody in here is allowed to do that. I mean, the professors when they say, "Who's your audience?" and w what was the other question? Who's your audience? And what, does it mean? and what does it mean? I mean, those are good those are good questions, but I just don't know that I need to know those <laughs> the answers to those questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll say this about Scott Eagle. Scott uh, said things to me in school that I just was like, I just was like, you know, you can't, like, what are you, like, my, like, I was tired of hearing it. And then, to this day, I mean, within weeks of now, I have been in my studio and Scott Eagle's words are echoing, you know. <laughs> It is terrifying. You're like a like a academic monster, an academic ghost. Uh, but but I mean that's really that's key because it helps me a lot. And those are those are I don't know, I don't think those are bad questions. Don't get me wrong because I think if you can face those questions and do what I'm saying, then you got the whole bag. I, uh, Eric Fischel does that. Like he doesn't back down from explaining. Here's what I'm doing. Here's why. And this is my audience. And I'm going. Man, it's, it's courageous. It really is. Because one of the ways that I manage my stress of the whole thing is to go, eh. <laughs> it's too stressful for me. So if you're one of those people that what you're saying by I'm tired of hearing it is that, hey, I'm tired of hearing this because it's too stressful for me. Well, maybe it's just an answer, a question you don't need to, to mess with and go on with it. But it doesn't excuse you from your purpose. So I, yeah.
But didn't you say Ruben said, be true to yourself, put all everything to, into it, and the, the things will follow? Yeah, well, he said make good things, and everything will follow. Whether you're true about it or not, I don't even know if that, like, uh, whatever. But, but like, really put, yeah, make, make the best thing we can make, and the rest will follow. The audience will follow. But that's not super, uh, what's the word? Uh, encouraging or, or comforting when you're coming out of school going, where am I going to sell my paintings? Where am I going to play my show? Where am I going to have a show? Who wants to know? No, like you got to, you're just kind of floating, it feels like. And really, in that way, I guess all you do is have your work. But I was beating up the pavement too when I came out of there, like walking around, talking to people. And, uh, maybe that would have, be helpful too. I, I know people can get online and make a lot of inroads to talking to people about going here and there, but I mean, you got to, there's a little self promotion that I guess has to happen. I, I've done my fair share. Uh-huh. Fascinated by it. Oh, thank you. It a long time last night and then studying pictures of it when we got back to the hotel. Mm. So I have my theory on kind of like how I interpret it, but mm -hmm. I would love to hear like your process and what it means to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's a self portrait of my boy to manhood. Um, it's reflective in that, in that way for sure. Uh, it's really emotional to me to see a young boy and know that, you know, he lives and dies. You know, that's that part when I when I was putting it together, that was the part that I was like, okay, yes. <laughs> it it's worth making. I can feel it. It's there. Um, that's a. I mean, those are the main points about it to me. So that's why for me, it, it feels like a cycle of life going uh -huh. clockwise, but then you have it rotating counterclockwise. Yeah. Is it going counterclockwise? Yes. It's always like, to me, I read it as like backwards with time. Like, that's where I correlate that with like lyrics. Um, that means it was set up wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hold on a second. But I don't think so. I think I'm, I think I'm wrong about this. It can't be. It can't be because it was geared. I've got the video footage right here. The the I think it's okay. No, no, I think it's okay. Um, hold on, hold on. I don't think it can be set up backward. Yeah. So that's uh, that's correct. So it's supposed to be reading it. So it'll say birth, and then as it comes, death will come before again. So it it's supposed to do that. Yeah, yeah. So birth, like death is right behind it, but it's coming. Yeah, yeah. It goes back around. So it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. I'll have to do one for for girl too, but I I don't know. Pretty pretty girl from <laughs> here. <laughs> it's gonna be different. That's Kyle. Kind of, yeah, it's gonna be different if you do that. <laughs> You've expressed yourself through visual art and through music. Is there any kind of creative expression that you look forward to exploring in the future? Something you haven't tried yet. Like a, what an example of that would be? Well, I mean, is there something that, that you have always wanted to do that you haven't got to try yet? Mm, sure, yeah. Like film and I, I definitely writing? Yeah. yeah, 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 but yeah, definitely. Uh, film would be one of them. <coughs> yeah, uh, yeah well, basketball is definitely one of them. Yeah, basketball. I don't think y'all know how serious I am about that. <laughs> Um, no, there are, there are, I don't, I, and, and, uh, I probably am not great at all of them, but I think there's some others that, uh, sometimes the, the I'm, I'm moved and I, I make them and just whether they get to a point where they accumulate to where I should share them. And the film thing, as far as acting is concerned, <laughs> you have to. You think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You have to. Well, there's a handful of them. But just the one you you were talking about at lunch. That's I think some of these people have heard them, and I um, I have like a handful. I've never acted in my life, but I have a handful of stories where I've been offered opportunities to act. Was your last uh, Actually, one was as a Delta Force uh, uh, secret, like uh, a Delta Force Army member, military person. And that's why I was doing CrossFit a couple years ago, because I was preparing for this role. And it was driving me crazy. And uh, so I said, this isn't going to happen. 
after a trip to Fort Bragg where I uh, shot guns with Delta Force guys and did the skydiving tunnel and this whole thing. This is an example. So I'm not good at Like, I don't think I'm good at it. I've tried this. <laughs> I'm really not good at preparing for an audition. Okay? So he's laughing because I was telling the story about in 2012 or 13, uh, I was invited to read for a part in a song called a movie called Song One with Anne Hathaway, and these people reached out. I said, "We think Scott will be great for this part," and I was like, "Oh well, if they think I'll be great for it, I must be right." <laughs> There was a movie before that that I got offered a part, and this was like hands down. I didn't have to read for it. It was called Ten Year. Has anybody ever seen this movie, Ten Year? Well, that guy reached out to me at some point and said, we'd love for you to do this film. And I was like, we have been on the road so much, I'll never, like me and my wife talked, and there was just no way I could do it. So it reluctantly said, I, I can't do this. Little did I know my ability, probably. But anyway, the one with uh, song one, I get invited to, to, uh, to come up and read. And they said, we're going to have you do four scenes with Anne, at, Anne Hathaway at this, uh, at this audition place. And uh, so, you know, this is the date. And so I was like thinking, I got this. Like, I'm, I'm like, I know how, I, like, I know how this is going to go. Like, <laughs> here goes just yet another chapter in my life. I'm just going to go act a little bit. So I read the, I, I printed out these scenes. I'm reading them. I'm like, I got this. Yeah, I got this. I go up the day of the, the audition, or the reading, it really, really was a reading, I think they call it, and I meet with the young lady who wrote the, the, the book, and she's talking to me about the role, and she says, so, what do you think about the character? I was like, well, what do you mean? She's like, well, you know, have you got anything to add, or do you feel like he's this or that? And I was like, well, I'm not sure. And she said, well, what do you think about the script? And I said, well, I just read the, the part. <laughs> She said, wait a second, you didn't read the script? And I was like, well, no. I said, I read the, not the whole thing, but I got these scenes down. I was like, I can, like, I was thinking I'll do these as me. Because the, the character in the movie was like, a, he's like a kind of, an, he's like an aging rock star. I mean, uh, you know, he's on sort of the backside, but he's a, he's a legend. He's a cult legend, sort of, and her brother's in a coma. And she's coming to a show. She doesn't know who he is because she works in the Peace Corps or something like that. And she's coming to the show to be like, hey, I don't know who you are, but my brother loved you and he's in a coma. So anyway, that's the first scene. I, I show up to this place and when Anne Hathaway walks in the room, it's, it's obvious whose room this is, okay? Like, <laughs> like she, she's a, a top of the list. Um, and there's like this conference table and there's four people there, the lady who wrote the, the, the movie. There's another lady who knew me, but I didn't... I don't know from she's from North Carolina. She's a producer now or something. And then uh, a few like really, really sophisticated people that that, <laughs> that were none too impressed with me. <laughs> but uh, so she said, "Go read the script." Uh, so I go back and I read, and I'm going, uh, I, "I should have read the script because there's a lot here." Can you guys imagine preparing for a role where you just didn't read the script? <laughs> That's where I say your, your ego can really get you in a position where here I am now, flown up to New York, ready to try for this thing that I'm thinking is just going to go my way. We start the, like, it's like this, that we're going to read and these people are just like, you know, like just watching us, you know. And I'm sure the lady had already called them and said, this is not the guy for this. He didn't read the script. This is not. So the first scene, I'm like looking at it going, okay, you know. And I got my guitar because there was one part where I would have to play two songs and so they could see what that was like and I'm like reading and she's preparing They're like okay you guys go ahead so there's a little little beat little moment and I can't remember if I said something first or she said something but I look down I look up to engage in her in, in the scene and she's in full tears <laughs> full mode like beat up like in character and I'm just like <laughs> <laughs> Just a deer in the headlamps. I'm like, oh my God, like. <laughs> so why did you come here? <laughs> and I'm like, she is letting me have it. She's, she knew, she sensed this, and I know they're just like, oh my God. <laughs> this, they're like, this, this hillbilly came up from North Carolina. So we go through the four scenes and it's just like, it's wretched. And after the first three, they're like, well, why don't you play a few songs? 
So I did a couple songs, and that was like that. That was my moment. Like I felt it. I was like, "This is good. I got it now." The, the room for that moment was mine. We went back to it. I kind of was going at the end of the thing. We're still reading. We're doing the parts in the last scene. I'm finally relaxed. So I'm at least relaxed. They can at least see that I can relax. And uh, she's talking to me still. And I, she went off script, but she's in character still. And I'm still talking to her, and I'm answering her questions, and I'm interacting with her, and I'm going, okay, so we're still, okay, I get it. We're still in character. <laughs> so I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And she just stayed there and just kept going with me to where I was just like, I have no idea if we are. Which, and then I wrote a lyric about it. Uh, is this a Broadway show or are we still in whatever that lyric is? But that's from that because I was just like, I have no idea if we're even. And it just trailed into sort of a normal conversation where she started saying, so you have, you're, you have kids? And I said, yeah, I have a couple kids. And she said, you live in North Carolina? I said, yeah. She's like, good luck with that. <laughs> I was like, man, I was like, yeah, she's incredible. I mean, she's incredible. She, she was like, she's in command of her, of her oh, art. God. But I left and I, as I walked out on the 42nd Street or whatever it was, I just laughed at myself. I called Dolph our manager, I was like, yeah, I don't think I got the part. <laughs>